Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this, the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. An absolutely gorgeous summer Sunday morning. While everybody else is out having fun on this Labor Day weekend, you're stuck in church, huh? Well, we'll try to make it worth your while. I know a lot of people do a lot of things here in volunteering at at St. John, but I just want to make special mention of a couple weeks ago, a whole crew of of guys... uh, put the eight new louvers on the bell tower, which was quite a job, which was quite a job to do. And <laughs> while we were doing it, Don Velker was there and saying, you know, we should have put one of those louvers on a hinge because any time the uh, rope comes off the pulley of the bell, you've got to get up there with a lift or something and unbolt the louver and take it out and crawl up in there and put the rope back on the pulley. Well, that doesn't happen very often, we thought. So then Tim goes in to ring the bells this morning, and one of the ropes is off the pulley. So <laughs> we'll get that figured out. But again, thank you. Thank you all for that. So some uh, prayer requests that I have this morning. We'll continue to pray for Pam Zahn as she continues in hospice care, but now at Hospice House. For Kathy Reisman, who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, Kathy has requested prayers. We light our candle on the first Sunday of each month for our uh, companion congregation, Reach Pan in South Africa, and we'll pray for them. We'll pray for uh, the situation in Afghanistan, folks who got left behind that shouldn't have been left behind, and you know whatever's going to happen there, we'll pray for the folks in that country. And also for those in the wake of Hurricane Ida, Pray that they'll, those folks will be able to recover. And I didn't think about it, but, you know, we used to pray for all the birthday people. And I had a special prayer, and I don't have a special prayer, and I don't have a list of the birthday people. But you know who you are. Those of you who have birthdays in the month of September, and I don't have my official prayer in front of me, but let's say a prayer for these folks. Dear Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you have given us throughout our years. We thank you for family and friends and all that you have surrounded us with. And we pray, Lord, that in the coming year for all of those celebrating birthdays in the month of September, you will continue to surround us with faith, hope, and love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So that will have to do for all you birthday folks. So happy birthday to you. Are there any other prayer requests? I've lit a candle for the four requests that I have received. I've got two candles left. Anybody have any other prayer requests that you'd like to mention this morning? Well, you just turn around and you're right in the back row there. Yeah. <laughs> but I appreciate your concern. You can talk to them after, see how they're doing. Any other prayer requests? Well, with that, I invite you to please stand as you are able as we begin our worship service with confession and forgiveness as it is printed in your worship folders. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by Christ's authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins, 
in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our gathering hymn, 697, Just a Closer Walk with Thee, and we're going to do it just a little bit differently. You see, it begins with a refrain. So what we're going to do, and again, this is 697, we're going to sing the refrain as verse 1, then we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3, and then we'll go back and sing the refrain again as verse 5. Any questions? All righty, 697. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious God, throughout the ages you transform sickness into health and death into life. Open us to the power of your presence and make us a people ready to proclaim and live in your promises through Jesus Christ, our healer, our hope, and our Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the reading of God's Word. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> the first reading is from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4 through 7. Say to those who are of fearful heart, Be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we will read Psalm 
146 responsively. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals in whom there is no help. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the seas, and all that is in them, who keep promises forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who are hungry. The Lord set the captive free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout the generations. Hallelujah. The second reading is from James chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a, pers a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves? and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith and be the heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. If it is not the rich who oppress you, it is not they who drag you into court. Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and you convict and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you. If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. Please stand as you are able as we preface the reading of today's gospel by singing the gospel acclamation. Hallelujah, Lord and Savior, open now your saving word. Let it burn like fire within us, speak until our hearts are stirred. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon, towards the Sea of Galilee, 
Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears and spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. So this morning in Jesus' conversation with this woman in the Gospel of Mark, he seems to be acting like a real jerk, doesn't he? Let the children be fed first, he says, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Now, it could be that Jesus is just being the human Jesus. We do as Christians, after all, proclaim that Jesus is fully human and fully divine, right? So maybe he's just being a, a human, and we know a lot of humans who are jerks, and we all probably behave that way every now and then. So maybe that's what's going on as he tells this woman that he is saving the children's food for the Jews which is definitely not intended for the dogs, the Gentiles. However, upon closer examination, I don't think this makes a lot of sense because Jesus has intentionally gone into the region of Tyre, which is pretty much a Gentile territory. Mark writes, from there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. So... This is probably not a very good example, but it's like, a, let's say you have a, 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 a vegetarian produce seller who decides to set up a stand in cattle country and yet refuses to sell his kale to any curious cowboys who might be stopping by. They come by, look at his wares and say, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try some of that fancy lettuce there. Sorry, cowboy, I don't sell veggies to cowboys. And why in carn sarnet did you set up a stand to sell vegetables in cowboy country if you ain't going to sell vegetables to cowboys? Doesn't make sense, does it? Well, therefore, it doesn't make sense to me that Jesus is in Gentile country, territory, simply to snub Gentiles. Rather, I think he has gone to share the gospel message, the good news, with the Gentiles. And in the specific case of this woman in today's story, he is pushing her, pushing her hard to come to terms with her faith, to come to terms with what that good news might mean for her, to come to terms with the extent of her faith. Just as life often pushes us to come to terms with the extent of our faith. So before we go any further, Pastor Dan, please remind us again, what is, what is faith? Well, faith can be defined in a lot of different ways. But if we hear the writer of the epistle lesson from James today, you might believe that faith is a means to an end. So faith by itself, James writes, if it has no works, is dead. According to James, the law, and the law is what we do, the law is how you could say we respond to God's love, trumps faith, which is accepting God's love. So, in other words, being good and doing good is what really matters. Therefore, the primary message from the Bible, the primary message from the pulpit every Sunday should be a reminder to us all to be good and to do good. After all, 
If the Bible and the church do not consistently and constantly remind you to be good and to do good, who will? Everybody. Since the day you were born, your mother has encouraged you to be good and to do good. Your father has commanded you to be good and do good. Your teachers and preachers have asked you to be good and to do good. Your grandparents have pleaded with you to be good and to do good. And as a result of this command for us all throughout our entire lives to be good and to do good, we live in paradise, right? Eh, well, not exactly. If you look around, if you look around, you see that that's not the case. So, logic would tell us that that approach hasn't been working real well. Has it? And why not? That's because the law, the law by itself, will not save. The law will not transform your life. And the law, therefore, will not transform the world in which we live. In the midst of what I believe is a wrong-headed understanding of our relationship with God in Jesus Christ, the writer of James asks, can faith save you? Yeah, James, it can. That's what Jesus Christ is all about. You see, the life of the Syrophoenician woman in today's Bible story was not transformed by her adherence to the law. The life and death of the, I should say, the, the hearing of the deaf man and the sight of the blind man were not transformed by his obeying the law, but rather by a call of faith. Will being good and doing good make your life better? Yeah, probably. But will being good and doing good transform your life? No. No, it will not. And that is why last week, Pastor Trophine mentioned to you that James, this epistle from James, there was a reading last week from James as well, was referred to by Martin Luther as the straw epistle. And straw, I think, is a, a good analogy. Back in Luther's day, straw could make your bed much more comfortable by sticking more straw in there. Straw can make your life much more comfortable. But straw has virtually zero nutritional value. Straw, while it can make life more comfortable for you, cannot sustain you whatsoever. So why do we love the law so much? Why do we love it so much? Well, a couple reasons. Number one, it makes us feel like we're in control. If we try to be good and to do good, things will be better. And generally, yes, that is true. They will. So it gives us a sense of control. And also, it gives us an opportunity to point fingers because we all know that the people who really should be doing a better job of being good and doing good are those people. Ain't me, right? It's always, though, go on Facebook. It's always, those people are the people who need to be good and to do good because apparently I'm doing a fine job of it myself. That's why we love the law. Makes us feel in control, allows us to point fingers. The straw apostle. And in so doing, unfortunately, it gives us the excuse and the opportunity to turn our backs on what really matters, to turn our backs on a relationship with God in Jesus Christ. Can faith save you? Yes, James, faith can save you. The journey, the journey of coming to terms with the reality that you are unconditionally loved, and this morning, that's how I'm defining faith. The journey 
of coming to terms with the reality that you are unconditionally loved, that and only that can transform your life. Why do you suppose there's so much anger and hatred and greed and animus in the world? Is it because people are so self-satisfied with all the love that they have in their lives? No! It's the exact opposite. They're desperate. They're desperate and they're needy for the love that everyone, every human being needs. And I think we've discovered that more so than ever throughout the last, what has it been, 18 months now? That's what we need. That's what we need. And that faith. That faith of coming to terms with the reality that you are unconditionally loved, and you are, can give you the peace that passes all understanding. The law cannot. Faith can give you genuine hope in the promises and possibilities of God. The law cannot. Faith can allow you to live in the freedom of forgiveness. The law cannot. And faith can enable you to shed the shackles of desperate self-centeredness and run toward the light of genuine relationship. The law definitely cannot. In the gospel story from Mark this morning, which is one of my favorite Gospels. Which was the first Gospel? Chronologically, which, which was the first Gospel written? Mark. They're not in that order in the Bible, but Mark was the first one written. And uh, scholars believe that the other three Gospel writers all took bits and pieces from first reading Mark and adding to and embellishing their own take on things. I'm reading a book I'm getting off off track. I'm reading a book by Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is a New Testament scholar from the University of North Carolina, and it was his textbook that we used in seminary to study the New Testament. Later, I, later on, I learned that Bart Ehrman is an atheist. Now, you can still be an atheist and be a New Testament scholar, and he is probably the, one of the most highly regarded New Testament scholars in the United States, if not the world. But I'm reading a book. What's the name of it? Can't remember. But anyway, he's talking about all the Christian writings that are out there. Hundreds of Gospels. And over time and attrition and with certain criteria, right, wrong, or indifferent, Christians over the centuries distilled all of those Gospels, all of those hundreds of Gospels down into just four. But the message, and one of the reasons, and one of the reasons that Orthodox Christianity settled on these four Gospels is that the message is clear, and that is the message of love. Even though in the story this morning it seems like Jesus is far from exhibiting love, he's acting like a real jerk, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. However, I don't think he is intending to be socially crude, but rather he is intending to force this woman to come to terms with her faith and the extent of her faith, to come to terms with that which can change her life forever, to come to terms with that which can change your life forever. And that's faith. The journey of coming to terms with the reality that you are unconditionally loved. Faith can transform your life. The law cannot. Faith allows you to live in the promises and possibilities of peace and forgiveness and hope and love. The law does not. James asks, can faith save? Yeah, James, faith can save. 
is it a matter as a matter of fact as a matter of fact it is the only thing that can save the only thing any questions yes cliff has a question god i love questions It is. That's what didn't I say that? Oh, oh, I did. See, I'm see old man brain. No, Matthew is the first one in the Bible, but chronologically, the first gospel written was Mark. It preceded the writing of Matthew and Luke by maybe thirty years. So Mark came along, and then there was Matthew and Luke, and they're pretty close together about 30 years later. And then about another 20 years later or so came John. So chronologically, it's Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And of course, the very first writings in the New Testament come from the Apostle Paul, writing these letters to the churches, uh, to the Philippians and the Corinthians and the Thessalonians and scholars conclude that probably first Thessalonians was the very first uh, chronologically the very first book of the New Testament that that was written got another question okay Right? Is that no, scholars, scholars don't think that even though they're named Peter and John, that the books of Peter were not written by Peter, and the books of John later on, like First John, Second John, were not written by John. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's doubt that you know we think that Matthew was written by the the disciple Matthew. Maybe, maybe not which was not unusual back in those times. Uh, you didn't, if you were writing a book that reflected someone's ideas or thoughts, you could give that name to your book. It didn't necessarily mean that they wrote it. It meant that it was about their thoughts and their ideas. Any other questions? Very good, Cliff. Appreciate that. We will continue our worship service by singing our sermon hymn, which is, O Savior, Precious Savior, 820.
again invite you to please stand as you are able as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he is centered into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And as we continue to live in the grace of God this morning, we pray for the church, the world, and all of those in need, responding to, Lord, in your mercy, with hear our prayer. Gracious God, you bring your people together in worship. Enliven your church. Guide all who seek to share your love through word and deed. Bless your church around the world as we remember this morning our companion congregation in Reetpan, South Africa. And bless your church here in this place as we name this morning David Pocknow, Rose Rosenau, Karen Colby, Terry Swemke, Kurt Cooley, Jacob Paulson, Brian Nowak, Ron Schuster, Megan Eno, Holden Steinagel, and Ryder Schindler. Lord, in your mercy... Hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for water to nourish thirsty plants and to quell raging wildfires. Bring sunshine to allow floodwaters to recede. And Lord, inspire all people to show care for the world you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you show no partiality. Increase justice in all nations. Encourage leaders and governments to work with one another for the good of our common world. And especially, Lord, as we celebrate Labor Day, unite us in seeking the health, safety, and dignity of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you accompany those who are most in need. Shelter all who flee from violence or persecution. Protect any who are in danger. Be present, Lord, with those who are ill and dying. Sustain them, Lord, all through uncertain and unstable times. This morning we pray for Pam, Kathy, those recovering from the devastation of Hurricane Ida, those struggling Af in Afghanistan, and for all those, Lord, we now bring to you in the silence of our hearts and minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you support the work of your disciples. Continue to nurture the leadership and ministries of this congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you embrace all who have died in the faith and brought them into your glorious presence. We thank you for their example and rejoice in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We continue our worship with Holy Communion. I'll talk you through uh, the whole process, but just to make sure you've got... If you're participating in Communion this morning, make sure you have your individual meal... If not, please raise your hand at this time, and our usher will make sure that you have that. Okay. And part of the meal portion of our worship service is the offering, and uh, we have the uh, bucket, the receptacle, the spittoon, and on the table at the entrance to the sanctuary, 
the brass container uh, for your gifts. Uh, so you can uh, please make those contributions if you feel so moved. And I have no idea what the financial status of this congregation is, but you know, as we move forward, it, I think it's imperative that you continue to financially support the ministries of this congregation. And in thanks for your gifts, we pray, Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with the choirs of angels and the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people. For the forgiveness of sin, do this. For the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's Supper is prepared and all are welcome. So I invite you to take your individual meals. I know it can be a little tough sometimes to peel back that top thin cellophane layer to expose the bread. And I think we have some more user-friendly individual meals coming. So. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Now I'll peel back the tinfoil stuff to expose the wine. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we pray. 
We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, again, thank you very much for being here this morning on this holiday weekend. I appreciate, as always, your attendance. I think it's important. Obviously, I'm biased, but I do think it's important to be intentional about our faith, intentional, intentional about that journey of coming to terms with the reality that you are unconditionally loved. So let's see what we have for announcements. Take a look at the bulletin. Rally Sunday is next Sunday. Blessing of the backpacks and an ice cream social. If nothing should bring you to church, it ought to be an ice cream social, right? So that will be next week. And then um, snack, no date, snack donations for Maine Elementary. Take a look at that. And also a back to school food drive. Take a look at that as well. And uh, that's all I see here. Are there other announcements? Yes, Mrs. Harris. Also, next Sunday is recognition of new members. Recognition of new members, yes, between COVID and uh, the previous pastor's inability to really come to terms with this whole deal. I don't know what his problem was, but apparently there's quite a few folks who be, need to be recognized as new members, so that will take place next Sunday as well. Anything else? Well, with that, at, no, yes, Kirk. Pardon me? When? <laughs> okay. Thursday at 6.30, is that correct? So church council, Thursday at 6.30. Anything else? All right, well, as we go out into this beautiful day, I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our sending hymn is 886, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, 886.
let us go in peace and live in the love of the Lord. Thanks be to God.